Hey, 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 good morning, everybody. What is going on? It is Brent Abel here, webtennis.com. Uh, Monday morning, start to a new week. Looking forward to a beautiful start to a day out here in the California desert. San Jacinto's just looming out there to the west. It's going to be a beautiful day out here. Uh, hope you're doing well, whatever you got going on so far. And um, look, uh, got to start off with a sad note. We lost one of tennis's great people yesterday, Dennis Ralston, who had been battling cancer for for a while. And um, um, man, tough, tough. I mean, I got to, I didn't know him, but I got the opportunity to ball boy for the Pacific Coast Tournament back in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up at the Berkeley Tennis Club in Berkeley, California. And we would always have the best players in the world show up there. They play the U.S. Nationals in New York, and then they go to L.A. and play the Pacific Southwest. And then uh, one of the last tournaments of the year in the schedule will be the uh, Pacific Coast in Berkeley at the Berkeley Tennis Club. And, um, you know, that was back in the day when no money. <laughs> I mean, there was a few bucks probably under the table, but but not much money. And so we would house players. We lived about a seven-minute walk from the – from the BTC and, and we house some of the great players of all time. Um, we never housed Dennis, but I did, I did get a chance to ball boy for him. Uh, we house players such as Maria Bueno and Darlene hard for, for years. And, you know, Maria Bueno would show up at the, at our house in September every year, late September, early October. And she'd have won, you know, the French the Wimbledon U S whatever. So that was pretty a big, that was a big treat for us, uh, for our family, for the Abel family every year. Um, but anyway, yeah, Dennis was um, just a tremendous player. You know, five grand slams in doubles, got to the finals of Wimbledon in singles. Um, and I've actually posted in the, in the comments area a link to an article that uh, a good friend, fellow BTC member and world-class tennis writer, Joel Drucker, uh, posted yesterday over at the uh, Tennis Channel website, and it's right there in the in the comments. And yeah, I mean, I would highly recommend you go over. It's a great tribute to Dennis. If you don't know about Dennis Ralston, um, it's a good article to give you a little background on him and what and what he accomplished. And as you guys may know, if you've been following me, oh, you know, I think early spring this year, or maybe late spring, I uh, did a series of interviews with Dennis. And uh, six or seven interviews with him and just kind of digging back into his past and some of his stories. And uh, I never, I never, ever published the replays, which I'm going to do uh, in the next week or so, because uh, Ralston family is could use some help financially with all the expenses they've had to endure with um, what Dennis has gone through. So I'm going to package them up. I'm going to put them out there and you can pick them up and you can just you can donate to the GoFundMe page. And when you do that, I'm going to give you uh, all the replays packaged up into video, audio, and also and also a transcription as well. So guys, um, with that said, uh, I, want to, I want to tell you about something that I learned from Dennis probably five or six years ago in Austin, Texas. And at the time, I was visiting a good friend of mine, Tony Dawson. And uh, Tony was was working with Dennis at the time on his game. And, you know, if you don't know Tony, great senior player, um, lots of gold balls and singles and doubles and uh, and also played on several USA World Cup teams. Um, but originally from Australia, great player. And and look, so I got a chance to be on Dennis, I'd say three or four times. And um I'll never forget this one time. I'm I'm on the court with Tony and someone else. I can't remember who the third person wa uh, was at the time, but we were working on my serve and volley, and and I, I remember you know playing some points, and and Coach Alston is there right right next to me, and I come in, I get this pretty fat you know first volley opportunity. And uh, I hit it clean as a whistle back in, you know, I served the deuce court came in and, and got this backhand volley, first volley. And I just rattled the tape, right? It just hit it really hard right at the tape. And, and, you know, I lost point and, and coach Dennis comes up to me and says, well, what was your target on that? 
And I said, well, you know, it's that spot over there on the court, probably, I don't know, three feet inside the baseline, three feet inside the singles line. I mean, a relatively safe target, maybe five feet. I don't know. I wasn't going for anything crazy, but he said, so, so that was a, a spot over there on the court. Right. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, can you see the spot over the top of the net? And I said, no, because I was far enough back from the net that, that at my height, at 5'10", I'm, I'm actually, I can't look over the net at that target. And so I'm looking through the net. And he kind of said, well, could you see it if you were, you know, if, if we put a, a drape over the net where the net was blacked out, could you see your target? And I said, well, of course not. And he said, and he told me a story about what he got and one of the, and he got a lot from Pancho Gonzalez, but one of the things he got from Pancho was that your target's not a spot on the court, on the, on your opponent's side of the court. Your target is a spot, is a window above the top of the white line, above the net. And if you hit that target, it's going to equate to eventually it'll end up on the spot that you want over there. So all you got to do is find in this particular volley is what's that spot above the top of the net. So we, we then played some points and all I did was think about, well, wait a minute, that, 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 that tape on the net, right? The white part of the, the very top, it's kind of like a backboard, right? It's just like the same thing as a backboard. When we go out there on a backboard or, or we hit against a wall, our only thought is to hit the ball above the top of that painted white line um, on the backboard or on the wall. And, and so once I stopped thinking about trying to keep it inside the baseline, inside the sideline to a spot on that court over there on the other side, and all I started thinking about was, well, what's the little window that I want this ball to travel through above the top of the white line? everything changed. Now all of a sudden I got some swing freedom that I'd never felt before, right? Especially in the volley, right? I'd come in and just now I just felt like I could really go after it to that spot above the top of the net. Uh, I, I share this, this story as well, which is well, not really a story, but kind of an analogy, which is golfers go out there and when they've got a really long putt, I don't know, 30, 30 plus feet, well, they figure out the line they want the ball to travel to eventually get, get nearer into the hole. And then what they do is they, and rather than thinking about, well, I'm putting all the way to the, to the cup, they bring the target back about five feet in front of, them, maybe even less than that, right? They, they read the line back to where the ball is and they just go, well, my target's five feet. If I can hit the ball through that target, if I've got the line right, it's eventually going to go in or near the cup. And so what they do is they bring their target close. Well, it's the same thing in this. When you think about a spot over the top of the net, you've brought your target much closer to you, which is for me, it's much more tangible than let's say, let's say it's not a volley. Let's say it's a ground stroke and all things being equal, right? I'm going from the middle of the court back up the middle of the court, which is 78 feet, right? Well, if I'm thinking that I want my ball to land three feet inside the baseline over there, that's what, 75 feet. That's a pretty, that's a pretty long target, right? But if I bring it back to the net, well, what's the height over the top of the net I want to have as my target? Well, now I've just cut my 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 target spot in half. And for me, that just is it is so much easier. And and I I don't worry about I gotta make sure I don't hit the ball out, right? So Part of that is when we have a target that's on the other side of the net, on a spot on the court over there. And by the way, if you're back in the baseline, you can't see it. I mean, you, you, you can't look over the net. You can see it through the net. That's a little bit of a kind of a screwy thing in your mind going, well, I, I see my target, but I've got to hit, I got to hit away from it because I've got this obstacle in front of me, the net. So start thinking about, well, let me finish up my point about that, which is, when I think about a target, it's a, it's a spot above the top of the net. I, I don't worry about hitting the ball out. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but now I've got this swing freedom where all I've got to do is hit it to that spot. And if I hit it to that spot, um, it's going to stay inside. It's going to stay uh, inside the baseline. It's going to stay inside the sidelines. So I got that from Dennis, and I'm telling you, that was, I don't know how many years ago, 
you know, I don't know what it was, maybe five years ago, six years ago, just things changed for me. It just got, the game got more efficient, got more simple. Uh, I guess got better clarity. And so I encourage you to try that today. When you go out there today or the next time you're out in the court is go out there and start thinking about what's the spot above the top of the net you want the ball to travel through. And, and if you go out on a backboard or you have a wall or whatever it is, I mean, again, all we think about is all I want to do is hit the ball above that white line. That's the same thing as the net, right? That painted white line in the wall. Well, if you can get that feeling, that swing freedom feeling when you're on the backboard, when you're on the wall, when all you care about is I just want to hit above that line. And look, you don't know if it's going way out, right? When you've hit it, let's say two feet above that white line or three feet, you don't know because <laughs> the ball's bouncing back to you. But when you're on the court, and you hit that thing two or three feet above that white line, the net, I think what you're going to find is you don't hit the ball out. And that's that's pretty big burden off your shoulders if you're always worried about, well, I got to keep the ball inside that, inside that baseline over there. So that's something I got from Dennis uh, years ago, made a big difference for me. And um, try it, tinker with it. <clears throat> Excuse me, see, see if it works for you. I think it will. And... Um, and, and, and like, you know, for serving, I mean, even for, for, for serving, I've got a spot where I want my serve to go. Whether it's down the tee, it's to the body, it's out wide. Well, all three of those targets equate to, equate to a spot above the top of the net. And so once I've decided, you know, bounce the ball a few times, and in my mind I'm going, all right, well, I'm going body. I'm going body with this serve. And then I kind of look up, and as I look up before I start my tossing motion, I go, well, that serve is going to be that spot above the top of the net. And so my aim point, my where, where, where am I trying to hit my serve, now becomes a spot over the top of the net. <clears throat> whether it's serve and volley, whether it's serve and stay back, doesn't matter. I'm still looking for, I want my serve to pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, should have brought a glass of water out here with me. But I want, I want my serve to pass over the top of the net at a certain height. And you may have to tinker with this, right? You may have to go out there, get a bucket of balls, hit a few serves, and start experimenting with that thought in terms of what your target is with your serve. And maybe it's a little bit different for your first serve and your second serve. I mean, my second serve, probably just like yours, has a little more height over the top of the net, right? Number one, I want to, I don't want to flirt with the with, with the top of the net with my second serve. Um because I don't want to obviously don't want to double fault, but I also, if I'm going to get a rainbow type of high bouncing, maybe a slight little kick on it, I need to have that trajectory higher over the top net to come in and bounce up. And maybe that's a different height than it is on your first serve. I know it is for me. So when I'm looking over there to serve, I'm all, all I'm thinking about is what's the spot above the top of the net. I want my, um, I want, I want the ball to pass through. So, <clears throat> Hope this has helped, guys. Um, would love to hear your feedback on this. You can either just hit the comments area, um, and whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. You could um, uh, just shoot me an email, brent at webtennis.com. And certainly, I will also up update the description area um, on both sides with Joel Drucker's link to his really great article uh, in memory of Dennis uh, over at the Tennis Channel website. Um, so, guys, with that said, um, thanks for hanging out with me today. Um, tough day. Tough day for the tennis world, losing Dennis. Um, but, yeah, for sure, check out check out that article from Joel. Guys, um, thanks for hanging out with me. And, as always, get out there. Get out there and help someone else have a spectacular day. Guys, we'll do this again tomorrow.